Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over UFC 300, and this is going to be the first of three videos. I'm going to be able to do all three of them this week. Um, this week, this video, we're going to just go over from a straight DFS perspective who the best plays are, uh, given the various metrics and things like that. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to do a contrarian betting breakdown, which was kind of on fire last week. And then uh, Saturday morning, we're going to do a lineup construction video where we're only going to focus in on how to win the uh, the, the big uh, MME lottery contest, um, where we focus in on using the Sims, using Saber Sim, certain tricks to maybe get a little bit unique. Um, so a couple of characteristics about this card, um, which are sort of interesting. It is a 13 fight card, which... Uh, in and of itself means that you're probably going to need to, you know, to prioritize upside and not worry too much about uniques just because of the number of combinations. However, the, the issue with that is that there are three five round fights and five round fights. You just typically are going to get big projections out of, and they're almost always going to be at least to some degree, you know, kind of good plays. So it's, it, it might end up being a situation where it's more dupe than you might think of a 13 fight card, just because just so much ownership is going to come in those five round fights. I would imagine or at least two, of them, but, but, but almost certainly two of them, maybe even the, even all three. So uh, you are going to have to focus in on when we get to the lineup construction uh, of getting somewhat different and, and doing some kind of funny business, even though it's a 13 fight card. The other thing um, before we get into the um, quality of the card, is that there's it's kind of something out in the offing, which you know is probably going to re be resolved tomorrow at weigh-ins, where one fight is is in serious danger, and that is the Kayla Harrison fight, only because well for two reasons. Number one, she's currently usually is about twenty pounds heavier than her weigh-in, um, so it's going to be a very very tough weight cut for her to make. And I believe that Holly Holm has already said that if uh, Harrison does not make weight, Holm's not going to fight. Um, so if that's the case, if we're then down to 12 fights with uh, taking away one of the high-priced pivots or high-priced good fighters, then you're going to really have the possibility of being a, a very, very chalky card. Um, you you already have a, a you know, a what should we call it, a Bo Nickel play who is probably, with dynamic pricing, probably a 1000 underpriced. But um, just even even given the fact that they can't price these guys higher than, say, 9700 the fact that they only price him at 9500 makes him incredibly underpriced. And with the availability of so many good underdogs or so many at least reasonable underdogs, that to get to um, him is going to be so easy that – once again, it's going to create even, well, for a 13 fight card, sure, it, you can consider it a pretty chalky, it, the possibility of being pretty chalky. And yet, if that we lose that Harrison fight and you get a 12 fight card with three five round fights and an underpriced uh, and accessible uh, Bo Nickel, you're, you're going to have a real, real challenge to get unique. Um, and listen, we're up for it, but, uh, you know, something to keep in mind the other thing which is interesting because it's ufc 300 now again i don't get involved in the whole the hype and like the, the quality of the card per se because you know it's, they're offering offering a lot of money for first i don't care who's fight honestly just deal with the metrics as, as usual however because almost all of these fighters have fought multiple multiple times you know and, and everybody's heard of them and everybody's analyzed all their fights to death um, you could argue that the lines are are pretty are pretty efficient here, because again you don't have guys making their first they you know their de debuts you don't have guys with fishy, you know fishy other fights or something like that. So you, you have a lot of data on all of these fighters. So to to be able to identify someone as incredibly mispriced, I mean it's actually quite egotistical for people to say that you know going into this this card. I mean, so these these fighters have just so much information on them, and people have taped all these guys so many times that I do believe that the that the lines here are probably going to be somewhat efficient. So, uh, 
and, and usually what you end up happen, what usually you also get a dynamic where sometimes you'll get like the name fighters getting a little bit too much ownership. But unfortunately here, everybody's a name fighter. I mean, like who, who are you going to say like kind of has more name value than somebody else on a card like this? It's going to be very difficult. So uh, this is not the time to be a hero, I think, and identify someone as being mispriced. I think it's something where you just have to just kind of go with the metrics and just kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, and then figure out who the best players are pretty easily. And then we'll try to get different somehow when we do the lineup construction video. Um, so I, I guess we should just, you know, get right after it. Um, I don't know how to do this first. I, you know, I, I know how I'm going to do this first. I, I'm going to identify the two like easiest plays on the board first, I guess. And, and one I mentioned earlier, and that's Bo Nickel. So Bo Nickel, he's minus 2 million. You know, he's literally a 20 to one favorite. And not only that, but he is, you know, he's minus 1500 inside the distance. And, and not only that, but, you know, in the first round, he's minus 285, you know? So it's not to mention the fact that he's almost certainly, I don't want to say, say this, but he's very likely going to get at least one takedown. So he's got like a a five-point floor there, or, four point, or whatever point floor there, not to mention whatever ground control time he has or strikes or whatever. Um you could almost argue that he's got a floor of a hundred. You know what I mean? Like it's it's um it's a it's it's a very, very difficult play to fade from from a from a metrics perspective. Okay. So listen, you have to put 13 fights together and and and, and all of that. But you know, this is just you just don't get this. So it's uh something that you have to respect. Um the other one, which I think is, is to me, clearly the best play. And, and this one might actually be, I don't want to say more mispriced, but I may say equally mispriced. I mean, this, this, when you figure out, when you consider the context of this slate of this, of this fight, uh, the Weili Zhang price is sort of ridiculous. You know, like we Weili Zhang has, forget that she's, you know, five to one to win. She's, she's got five rounds to work with. And a path to victory that can score a billion points. You know, like he just look at her last fight. I mean, I'm not saying that she's going to get 191 uh, fantasy points, but just to show you what her style can do, this is certainly in the often, you know, even this 133. You know, if, if you're going to fade Zhang Wei Li, you, you're going to hope she does this. You know, you're going to hope that she does gets gets her out of there early. Like this is exactly what you would expect from if you if you're going to fade her. And the problem with this result is that the only reason this result happened was that was that uh, her opponent was more of the grappler. You know, and as far as it was the one going for takedowns or whatever. And so Zhang Wei Li just got the one reversal and just beat on her, you know, and then submitted her. But she has such a grappling edge here against Jan Am that, I mean, it, unless she's getting some really, really poor advice, she's going to try, at least, I would imagine, to make this fight look like the last one. And, and at 9,200, it's just it's just something that you have to identify as the best play. I mean, I, I think that she is the best play. I think she's a better play than, well, is she better than Bo Nickel? I mean, listen, it's minus 25 to 1 and minus 350 in the first round is kind of rough, you know, but um, I think that if you say both of them, let's put it this way, they're co-best plays. I think that's completely fair. And then I don't even think anybody else is remotely close as far as favorites go. I mean, and that's considering the fact that you do have some good plays. Like, like for example, uh, let's look at, uh, okay. Jalen Turner, Jalen Turner is an amazing play, like in general, right? Because look at it. He's he is eight, he's under 9K, which makes him where is he? he's 8,900. And his inside the distance line is minus what? It's like minus 160. I mean, that is like that is an elite bit of metric there. Now you don't have the, the takedown upside, so that's 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 doesn't have that going for him. 
but even in the first round, he's my, he's plus 135. You know what I mean? Like for his price, that's a really, really good play. And yet, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Wei Li Zhang play is significantly better. Um, so that that's that's the first thing is to identify those two top plays as clearly the top plays. Um, so Jalen Turner, as I just mentioned, obviously just very very strong, very very good play. And whenever you have you know fighters with extremely good metrics that are going to show up as good plays, you have to consider the opponents because you're 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 not going to get anything earth shattering. As I mentioned, everybody sees the same metrics. Everybody has the same data. And people are going to get to the exact same analysis I did, with the, especially those first two fights and even the Jalen Turner fight. So what you have to do is consider whether their opponents are viable. Not that they're willing. Listen, they're not going to be better plays, but they whether they're even good enough to be viable. And if so, you're going to have to take shots, you know, to get leverage. So, like, going backwards, by the way, let, let's take a look at, well, let's look at Zhao Nian uh, first. Um, Zhao Nan Yan, Yan Zhao Nan. Considering that that Zhang is going to be the most popular fighter on the slate, um, I would imagine. Uh, y- you have to consider whether Yan's viable. So, how what does Yan's wins look like? I mean, I guess she could get a a finish, but. It doesn't look very likely, you know, like plus over 10 to one. Um, maybe she wins with volume or something like that. So he, this is the problem. I mean, she doesn't look like a great play. However, I mean, I will say that that maybe the leverage is enough for me to get to her. I have to really think about this. Um, you certainly going to get all kinds of leverage. Um so maybe even her some how is she gonna win? I don't whatever. She is gonna win. She's gonna win 20% of the time. That's just the way the way odds work. And if she does win, how does she not kind of get in the optimal? Right? If she's 7K, how is she gonna win? She's either gonna knock her out or just do enough in five rounds somehow. And and for her to do enough in five rounds somehow, it's gonna mean like a lot of significant strikes and just being better on the feet than we thought. That plus the leverage, I think you're just going to have to play some of this. Um, now, let's look at Cody Brundage, for example. Like, he he is going to win this fight. How often? Well, I don't know. Let's split the difference between the, the money line. So, it looks like about 8% of the time or so. Does that make sense? Maybe 7% of the time or so. So, question what do the Cody Brundage wins look like? Um, well, let's let's have a little bit of vision here. So so Bo Nickel goes for a takedown. Cody Brundage, you know, jumps guillotine, gets a good guillotine choke, and submits him in the first round. 105 points. All leverage, optimal. Let's go, right? So that's definitely possible. Cody Brundage gets a lucky, whatever, punch first round. Uh, knocks out first round, 100 points. Uh, big leverage, let's go. Okay, Are there any variations where he wins and doesn't make the optimal? Uh, or doesn't score well? I guess probably not. I mean, I guess I could see it. I mean, like if he gets involved in some situation where he can control Bo Nickel somehow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's that likely. So the question is, how often does all of that happen? You know, like if, if so we decided 7% of the time he's going to be optimal. Is that good enough? I mean, I mean, you could argue that he's going to be, you know, only 5% owned. So he's technically more optimal than his ownership. And you could certainly argue that that all of his wins also knock out all of those Bo Nickel lineups. So that's certainly a case. He doesn't win a lot, though. 
Okay. Uh, and and th so that's the difference between the Yan Zhanan play and the Brundage play. The ja Yan Zhanan play, I think, is is probably twice as even better, twice as good as the Brundage, but just because of the the chances that it actually happens, you know. Um, now, with that said, I think Zhang is also going to be higher owned than Brundage. I mean, you might get fifteen percent ownership. Not Zhang. Um, you might get fifteen percent ownership out of Yan for you know all the reasons I just mentioned, and just the fact that you do get five rounds to work with, people might play her. Um, so, but I do think you do have to deal with 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 both of these fighters in the one fifty. But again, as far as like the best plays, you know, I hate to just distract from this video, but uh, yeah. And going back to the Jalen Turner fight, so Renato Moicano, you know him, he's plus you know plus two hundred. He's like seven seventy three hundred. That's okay. Now his inside the distance line is not great. It's plus three, you know, somewhere around plus three twenty. But that's actually not bad. And and something else, he does have takedown upside. So considering again what I just said, I mean. Turner's going to show up as a really, really strong play. Moicano doesn't look that bad. So right off the bat, we've identified probably the three best plays, and yet still, we're making a case for their opponents. Okay? Uh, if I had to rank the the underdogs that I just mentioned, boy, um, it's a good question. As far as who's the best play of those, I guess Moicano has to be just because he's going to win more often and it's, he has pretty good uh, inside the distance line. I mean, it's okay. Plus the takedowns. So I'd rate a Moicano, then Jan, then or Xiao Nan, and then Brundage. Okay. Let's go back. So beginning of the fight, beginning of the card, Figueredo versus Garbrandt. I, I can't imagine this being any good. Um, you have... Figueredo is 9,100. And, you know, given, given, given what we've just said about like what types of, of fighters they are, there are here, you know, you have these, some of these inside the distance lines. Well, I don't know, like, like Figueredo, I, I didn't expect to see this like minus minus one ten inside. Um, this is, this is not bad now, but again, it's not bad, but it's not that great compared to these others. Like it's like Jalen Turner is a much better player. Okay. He has a better inside the distance line, and he's cheaper. Um, but I guess it's possible that that as the as low owned pivot, uh, I think you know Figueroa is fine, and his his metrics in and of themselves aren't bad. You know, so let's just say you're going to play, you know, Moicano, and you're going to fade Turner or something like that. Then you could play Figueroa. I think it's totally reasonable. Uh, Garbrandt, not so much. See, his inside the distance line is poor. He also doesn't have takedown upside. And and here's here's the rub. I don't think Figueredo is going to be particularly high owned. Okay, so also you're not going to be getting a lot of uh, a lot of leverage. So I don't like the Garbrandt play uh, with respect to um, what you call it uh, as as a good underdog. Uh, Jim Miller versus Bobby Green. Um, I, I think that Jim Miller is probably going to get played here. I mean, he always, he just always seems to do it, you know. Um, but anyway, we'll 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 get back to that. Let's just let's just let's just get back to reality here. Bobby Green minus one eighty. His inside the distance line is going to be very poor. It's going to be plus what uh, plus three hundred. At 80, what, 500? It's just not playable as far as DFS goes. Now, again, you want to get to it for leverage and lineup construction and all that stuff. We'll get to that another time, but certainly not a good play. Jim Miller at 7,600. I think he's going to be probably a little over, but we'll, we'll we'll take a look. Forget that for a minute. Jim Miller inside, what is he, plus 200? I guess it's all right. Jim Miller plus 250. At that price, so I guess he's reasonable. The only thing going against him is is, is the um, the lack of ownership that's going to be on Bobby Green. So you're going to get, I mean, so he's a decent enough play, but I just don't think that 
I mean, we'll get to others that are, I think are better, better metrics. And you're going to be, and you're going to get a lot more, you know, a lot more leverage. So I, I think Jim Miller is not one of my favorite underdogs. Um, all right. Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. I, I'm imagining this fight's not going to be very, very uh, lucrative as far as DFS goes. Two women fighters without a lot of upside, I don't think. Let's take a look. First, let's look at the prices. Well, I didn't even realize Andrade's favorite. That's, I, bar I barely even knew that. Well, interestingly, though, <laughs> well, you have an $8,100, $8,100 price, and yet Andrade is a full minus 140. So you do have some line value in Andrade. Uh that's not to be, uh, you know, listen, it's it's not completely determinative, but it's not to be ignored either. This is, uh, let's take a look at the inside the distance line as well. So, Andrade inside plus 200 at 8,100 plus the line. Oh, my God. I, I think you got to play this, no? I know people will say that this is like good line value. Is anybody actually going to do this? I didn't look at ownerships yet, but are people actually going to play this? I don't know. We'll see. I, I think it's a good, I think she's a good play though. And Rodriguez, I mean, poor line value, poor inside the distance. I mean, I can't imagine that being any good. Again, there's, there, there are other slates where Andrade would be chalk, you know, but there's just so much other, so many other spots here that I don't, I don't think she's going to get played. I don't know. We'll see. But I do like her. Diego Lopes or Lopez versus Sadiq Youssef. Um, 80, what is he, 8,400? Lopes, uh, Lopez, or 8,500, 7,700. Not the greatest as far as line value goes, that's for sure. Might actually argue that Yusef might actually have a little bit of line value. Well, let's take a look at Lopez's inside the distance line. I'm afraid it's going to be too tough to pass up. Yeah, so Lopes inside the distance is like plus 110 to plus 130, something like that. So it's uh, at his price, that's going to be a very, very good play. So he's a very, very good underdog here. He does have... Does he have takedown upside? I wouldn't call it takedowns. I mean, he's more of a pure grappler. Doesn't really go for takedowns per se. Um, and I guess that means something. But he's also a very, very good striker. He has knockdown upside. I, I think he's a pretty good play. And Yusuf, on the other side, uh, not that great, right? Inside the distance, plus like 370. That's just not going to be good enough. So I think Yusuf is going to be probably a thing. But Lopes is, is definitely pretty good. So the aforementioned Kayla Harrison versus Holly Holm. Uh, if this fight actually happens, um, we have the possibility of, of, of a fighter that could compete with those top fighters for points. Um, because, you know, Kayla Harrison, if things do go her way, she has a good path to victory to score a ton. Uh, she's very aggressive. She does go for takedowns, and when she gets her takedowns, she tries to go off, you know? So she is a she has the possibility for being an extremely high draft team scorer. Now, on the other hand, Holly Holm and Holly Holm fights are basically usually where fantasy points go to die. She she she's a very, very she's a very high IQ fighter. And she will try to work whatever strategy is necessary for her to win. So if she does what she usually does, which is the right thing, whatever that is, she's going to probably try to keep this fight at range. Um, and if, in fact, they do get tied up, it's going to be a big clinch, you know. Um, and so what, what, what you run the risk of doing, if you do play Harrison, is running into the Holly Holm molasses you know, effect where you just might end up eventually getting the win, but uh, you might end up not scoring all that much. Um, however, everything I just said is like sort of narrative. You know what I mean? Like I say that 
she has good fight IQ, you know, and I say that, you know, uh, she can do these things, like keep the fight at range and all that stuff, but not so easy. You know, she's 42 years old and, and, and they're going to be coming after her here. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the inside the distance line to go along with all that takedown upside. I mean, Harrison plus 150, not, not, listen, it's not like the plus 500 or whatever, or plus more than that of, of, of uh, nickel. And it's not like the minus 160 of Turner or whatever it is. But when you, when you keep in mind the possibility for takedown upside, you're just going to have to play her if she makes weight. Um, and on the other side of this, the thing about the Holly Holm piece is that I don't think that her path to victory scores particularly well. And yeah, I mean, she's, she's really cheap, but I still don't think that that's enough. I mean, you have these other underdogs with a little, just so much upside that I don't think you're going to be able to get away with a Holly Holm type score. Uh, on this card. So I grudgingly, I think that Harrison is probably a good play. I mean, obviously if she makes weight uh, or if they let her fight, or even if she doesn't make weight and you're just going to have to play her for that type of upside. And I think that home, she can ruin lineups, but I don't think she can win any, you know? So uh, I'm probably not going to. Aljamain Sterling versus Calvin Cater. So, I mean, Sterling has all the grappling upside and Kadar or Qatar Kadar is the striker. And normally what we do is we just play, you know, the grappler because of the, of the takedown upside, unless there's some reason not to um, let's, let's see if we can figure one out. I mean, turn uh, Sterling's only 8,400 and, you know, has a pretty decent line value at minus 180. If you want to know the truth. Um, like Lopes is only minus 145 at pretty much the same price. I imagine that Sterling's inside the distance line isn't all that great. I mean, plus, depends who you ask. I mean, right here, what is this? That way, you're telling me that you could play Sterling not by decision at minus 163? I'd probably do that. I, I don't think Sterling has a lot of finishing upside here, honestly. Um, but does have takedown upside. So you, you're going to have to play him. Uh, Cater inside, terrible. So he's going to be, you know, he's going to be a fade. Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. All right. So we have to be very, you know, respectful of this 80, of this price, of this price point. 8,200, 8K, you know, uh, you don't need too much as far as it inside the distance line here. Let's take a look at these guys. Cause I know, I know that Prohaska has the, the reputation for being more of the finisher and Rockets has the reputation for being more of the technical guy. Let's just make sure that the actual numbers back all this up. So let's see Prohaska inside. Yeah. He, so he's inside his plus. Yeah. I don't know what this bet way is. This bet way doesn't exist. Honestly. Uh, Prohaska inside probably about plus plus one fifty or so where Rockets is like plus 230. But, you know, Rockets plus 230 inside is not that bad. You know? I mean, to that point, we were just talking about playing Jessica Andraj at plus, what, what was she? At plus 220-ish inside the distance. So Rockets is not that much worse than than if any than Andraj. Um and I actually think Rockets is going to be equally low owned at the end of the day because people are going to want to play Prohaska. I mean always, you know he's in, his fights never make it out of the third round. So if or the second round really actually you know he had an amazing fight against Glover. That was that was insane. Um but uh you, you the, the the perception is that all the, the finishing upside is with Prohaska not even a perception, the numbers indicate that as well. So Prohaska ends up getting a little too much money here because of ins his inside the distance line. I think Rockets could be an interesting little piece of leverage here. So so I like both sides of this, actually. And listen, you do have to be pre prepared for Rock for results where Rockets scores 80 in a win. I mean, it's definitely possible. But 
find it hard to believe that that a Prohoshka fight can produce a winning score for 80 of 80 for anybody. So I actually like both sides of this. Uh, Prohoshka is definitely going to be the the more popular of the sides, and for probably for good reason. I mean, it's minus you know second. <laughs> what, what was I going to say? Second, uh, twice as good of an inside the distance line, but. I think Rockets didn't play as well. We talked about Bo Nickel, Cody Brundage. All right, and 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 unfortunately, I, mean, I wish there were worse fights, but they're not. You know, you have Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian, and here we're going to have probably, I'm guessing, well, in back-to-back -back fights, probably the two highest-owned underdogs on the slate. Um, one being Olive. Uh, oh, uh, Oliveira and the other being Holloway, which we're going to get to in a minute. I mean, all Oliveira does is finish people. You know, he either loses or he finishes people. And his price is at 70, whatever, was what he 7,400 or something like that? I mean, at 7,500, people are just going to play him. I mean, they just are. And, and it's kind of hard to dispute. You know, like you, you look at even his inside the distance line, it's, it's plus 220. And we were just talking about Rockets and this other. And what's it? What's your name? And Andrade at plus two twenty, and, and he's you know 600, 700 points lower. So it's obviously an amazing play, um, and yet <laughs> Sarukian on the other side, his inside the distance line isn't quite as good as some of these others, at like plus a hundred or whatever this is. But he's got takedown upside, and he's got kind of sneaky reverse leverage, right? Because if if Oliveira is going to be the most logical popular underdog, which I, I I can't dispute, then you get a little leverage playing Sarukian. So it's uh it's wild, you know. And, and, and I'm telling you, all of this and all this analysis so far hasn't even gotten the three round fights. One second, hello. I'm sorry, I got I had to pause there for a second. I forgot where I left it. Uh, I guess it was that Sarukian and, and Oliveira are, are both good plays. All right, so we're at these five round fights, and what what can I say? I mean, they're five rounds, and both these fighters, Gaethje and Holloway, they throw massive volume. They're they're really aggressive, and they have five rounds to work with. Then it's probably going to score. You know, what can I tell you? Um, Holloway is probably I'm going to guess the third highest price fighter on the slate. I would say that Zhang is going to be one. I would say Nickel is going to be two. And then Holloway is going to be three. I mean, his money line is ridiculous. His volume is ridiculous. Five rounds. You know what I mean? Like this is just kind of an elite play. And what can you say about Jay Gaethje on the other side? He's got – he has finishing upside. He's got volume upside. He's got – now you're getting a little bit of leverage too. I mean, what can I say? He's a good play. Um, and I have to say, the main event I, – I think if I had to fade one of these fights, it would probably be this – I can't imagine why, <laughs> but – but just because the others are just seem a little, just a little bit better. I mean, look, you have good pricing. Pereira Hill, you have 83, 7,900. And you have a combination of good fit, good, a good inside the distance line for both fighters, like plus about a hundred for each guy. Not to mention that if it doesn't finish, you get five rounds of, of, of expert striking. Uh, I guess that's the way the fight busts, but the pricing is just so brutally you, you know wonderful with this price this this fight that what are you really going to score and loot and not get there i mean what 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 is the floor of a win look like here um 90 you know what i mean like like both these fights like the Pereira fight the, the holloway fight what the floor has to be 90 okay I mean, probably like a third round, like surprise KO or something like that. 
or a fourth round surprise KO. Once you get past the third and fourth round, now we're at volume taking over. So as I said, I mean, there, there are good plays along the way. But these five-round fights are tough, you know? Like, it's tough to fade these. This Gaethje Holloway fight, the Yan side, excuse me, the Zhang side of this fight, the main event, it's very difficult to fade them, um, which is why you're going to get a concentrated bit of ownership in all of those. You'll get a concentrated bit maybe in Oliveira, really good underdog, Nickel, you know, and these plays I mentioned, I mean, are are good, are, are fine. You know, Jessica Andrade's a good kind of, you know, offbeat play. Lopes even and Sterling, these guys can all score and Rockets and Kraut for Oscar, but they've got to really behave perfectly, you know. Um, and it's not as if I'm what, what's Prasca going to do? Going to run over Alexander Rakic? Has anybody ever? Um, so it's it's a tough card. It really, really is from a DFS perspective um, because the plays are obvious and everybody's going to see them. So with the when we do the lineup construction video, we're going to have to get pretty creative on how to try to win this 150. But we'll try. And uh, tomorrow we're going to do a betting breakdown. And uh, yeah, that'll do it for now. Good luck, everybody.